Uh, well, good evening, everyone, both in the room and those of you who are still at home. And welcome to what is the final uh, room's lecture of, of this year. Um, if there's, a, there's been a sort of theme through the lectures of which this is the last, we, we started, I think, with um, what everyone would agree who's hit there, a striking lecture about what happens in a country where there is no rule of law and no medical ethics and no expertise which has integrity, uh, except that imposed on it by a state, uh, namely certain parts of China. Uh, we then moved on to look at um, how our own profession is regulated, some of the issues around that. We then looked at problems that can arise for the legal system with experts in gen general. And today we come to talk about, or to hear a talk about, one specific type of expertise, which is brand new, uh, and also something which may occur in your practices, even at the very start of them, if you go near an inquest. And we're very privileged to have this evening uh, Dr. Susie Lishman come to talk to us about medical examiners. Um, Dr. Lishman was, from three years, so 2019? 17. 17, I'm sorry, president of the Royal College of Pathologists. She is a cellular pathologist practicing in Peterborough. Um, but to the to, to, to date, and, and is very distinguished, but her, one of her principal distinctions has been her campaign for an implementation of the system of medical examiners, um, which has now just about got off the ground. And if there's one lesson to be learned about the law, which is that passing an act of parliament saying something is going to happen, in this case, that there would be medical examiners, is not entirely the same thing as it actually happening. And this is something that has taken a long time to occur. Uh, Susie may say something about that, or she may just talk about what, what is happening today. So it's a great privilege to work with you to talk to us this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks, Robert, for inviting me here. And uh, thank you all for coming, both in person and online. Um, Assuming you can hear me, I can hear an echo. So, uh, so um, I could talk to you for a week about medical examiners, um, and I don't know how much any of you know, so I'm assuming no knowledge, and I'm going to give you a really broad overview. Um, I'm actually just going to put my phone up here so I can keep an eye on the time to make sure that I allow time for questions, uh, and I will be staying for drinks afterwards, so happy to, happy to chat then as well, um, because I'm sure... I can't cover everything in one go. So just a little bit about my background. You've heard a, a bit from Robert. So I'm a, a full-time diagnostic histopathologist or cellular pathologist. So I make diagnoses looking down the microscope um, and that's my full-time job. I'm past president of the Royal College of Pathologists. That's me in my robes there. I've been working with the Department of Health since I was vice president of the college. So um, for probably getting on for 10 years. Um, and I'm on the Death Certification Reform Strategic Programme Board actually titled committee um, that's been overseeing current reforms to death certification. I'm training lead for medical examiners um, and I chair the medical examiners committee at the Royal College of Pathologists. Uh, I am lead medical examiner for my trust. And to see if this works. That's a little photo there is with my team. Um, so implemented a medical examiner service from scratch um, in Peterborough. I'm lead medical examiner for all of Spire Healthcare, the private healthcare provider. They have 37, 39 hospitals around the UK, um, and I review all of their deaths within 31 days of treatment. I'm on the National Medical Examiner's Good Practice Series working group and part of his regional medical examiner group. Um, I'm a co-editor of the uh, only uh, textbook on medical examiners, and I'm a crematorium medical referee. And so my unique um, experience really is as a histopathologist and a coroner's post-mortem pathologist, um, a medical examiner and a crematorium medical referee. So I see this from all different angles. Um, and I think I'm unique in doing that because not many people who do all of those roles. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what medical examiners are, what they do, um, the timeline, uh, as Robert alluded to, it's taken a while. 
um, some of the governance in the system, which is still being worked on, uh, the funding, which has caused many of the delays, how we train medical examiners, I'll give you an update on where we are now, um, and particularly on the legislation, um, which is also taking some time um, on what's going to happen next. So medical examiners are senior doctors from any specialty, and that can be hospital or general practice. So an ideal medical examiner service would have a range of disciplines. I've got a cardiologist, an endocrinologist, um, a vascular surgeon, a general surgeon, four, four GPs, and three pathologists. Um, so a real range um, of experienced doctors. The Royal College of Pathologists was successful in bidding to be the host Royal College for medical examiners. Uh, so it didn't automatically come to us. Um, it was a competitive bid. Um, medical examiners are, at least initially, only in England and Wales. Scotland has its own system, as you'll be aware. Interestingly, Northern Ireland has since introduced an independent medical examiner service, which is loosely based on ours. Um, we also have people from Gibraltar uh, and as far away as Australia coming to see how we do this. You have to have a license to practice. So doc medical examiners can be retired but they still, they need to retain their license to practice. Um, one of the delays was because in the initial legislation, medical examiners were going to be employed by local authorities and that caused all sorts of problems. Local authorities didn't want to employ the doctors um, and doctors didn't want to be employed by local authorities. That really delayed them. And so the legislation was changed so that they could be employed by acute trusts. So, Hospitals employ all the medical examiners, including the GPs, and we cover the deaths within the hospital and in the community, but you're based in a hospital. Um, and that's really what's enabled us to progress with implementation. SSP, I'm not going to talk very much about, that's Shared Services Partnership, which is the NHS in Wales. Um, so Wales has a very slightly different way of implementing it because it has a devolved health service, um, but the principles are the same. And one of the important principles is that any medical examiner can review any death. So I don't just have GPs reviewing deaths in the community, um, surgeons reviewing deaths to surgery. Any of us should be able to review any death. And the aim is that ultimately every death that is not referred to the coroner will be reviewed by a medical examiner in England and Wales when the system becomes statutory. So there's already a lot of investigation, particularly in the acute setting of deaths. And there's a national learning from deaths system. And we work alongside this. And there's a little bit of overlap and lots of communication, but it is different. And this is probably the most important slide to understand what medical examiners do. We seek to answer three questions and we do it in three, three ways. What did the person die from? So this is about making sure that death certificates are accurate. We know that for as long as death certificates have been written, that many of them are not very accurate. Every audit has shown um, that, that they're not great. So we're hoping to improve the quality of death certification, which of course is the right thing for families to understand why their loved one died, but also for national statistics, for health policy making to understand um, you know, what sort of conditions people are dying from. The second question is, does this need to go to the coroner? And although the initial intention for medical examiners was that we would only review deaths that did not go to the coroner, what in practice has happened is that all deaths come to us and we triage them and say which ones need to go to the coroner. And the aim of that is to make sure that the coroner gets appropriate referrals. Because we know in the past some people would just refer everything because they weren't sure what to do and that would waste the coroner's time, be distressing for families, um, and some would not refer cases because they didn't want to for whatever reason, and that's also obviously inappropriate. So our job is to make sure the right cases go to the coroner. And then are there any clinical governance concerns? Have we identified anything? Have the families raised any concerns? And then we can feed those in to existing systems. And we do it through three steps. A proportionate view of the medical records. So for hosp hospital patients, that's generally a review of the final admission from when they came in to when they died. Um, for deaths in the community, we start by looking at the last three months of general practice records. And for both of them, we can go back as far as we need to. 
you sometimes find that somebody's got a disability uh, that has perhaps contributed to them developing pneumonia and dying, and you need to go back sometimes to birth to find out if that disability was a naturally occurring condition or whether it was a result of birth trauma or an accident or something. And then of course that would have to go to the coroner because the underlying cause of death would be an unnatural one. Um, so it's proportionate. We can't review everybody's entire medical record. We interact with the attending doctor. So we speak to the doctors who looked after the patient in their last illness and ask them to tell us about the clinical history and to propose a cause of death. Um, and what we do at the end of our review of the records is we come up with our proposed cause of death and then we have a look at the two and see if they're similar. Um, and often we will tweak the cause of death proposed by the attending doctor. They may have got things in the wrong order. Um, they may use not quite the right terminology. Um, they may put things in the wrong part sections of the certificate, um, but we can help advise. But ultimately, the doctor who writes the medical certificate takes responsibility for it. So they have to be happy with what goes on it. We can't as medical examiners tell them what has to go on there. And then finally, and probably most importantly, is interaction with the bereaved family. So until medical examiners were introduced, it was entirely possible for patients to die and the family never to hear ever again from the hospital or from a doctor um, to explain what's gone on. So we phone the family, we tell them what's going to be on the death certificate so that they don't get any surprises when they go to register the death. We explain what the terminology means so that they understand it and can relate it to what they saw happening to their loved one. We ask if they have any questions about the certificate, about the care uh, and the, um, the deceased person's last illness and whether they have any concerns. Um, and often people will say, no, it was brilliant, couldn't fault it, you know. And I, and I always say, is there anything we could have done better? Because there's always something you can do better and we're not looking for complaints. What we're trying to do is improve the service for future patients. Um, and at that stage, people will sometimes say, well, I wasn't going to mention it. I didn't want to make a complaint or I don't want to make a fuss or we're really grateful for the care, but, and then they'll mention something that's really useful. Um, and so we record and then act on that intelligence that we get back from the family. So why do we need it? You would think with all the other safeguards and checks when somebody dies, that we wouldn't really need medical examiners. So we have a death certificate where the attending doctor uh, says what, why they died. We have cremation forms. Um, we just have the one left now. Um, cremation form four, if somebody is going to be cremated. We have audit, we have the coroner, we've got NCPOD doing their audit, we've got the CQC, uh, we've got the learning from death. So there's lots of different people looking at um, deaths and the activity of doctors. And the short answer to why we need medical examiners is our treatment. But it's only the very short answer. Um, there's a, a much longer answer. Uh, this is Chris Bird, whose mother Violet was murdered by Harold Trittman, um, bumped him into him uh, in a lift uh, on the way up to Radio Ford going to speak on the Today programme um, several years ago about medical examiners. I had no idea he was going to be on the programme as well. Um, and um, so got to know him then and we got we were on the air and I think it was Justin Webb asked us uh, you know, and I'd said, you know, it was very disappointing that medical examiners haven't been introduced yet. And they turned to Mr. Bird and said, do you agree with Dr. Lishman? And he said, no, I don't. Oh, no, it was awful. I really put my foot in. He said, it's not disappointing, it's criminal that it hasn't been. Um, and was a brilliant spokesperson for the benefit of medical examiners. Um, lots of other reasons. So obviously Dave with Janet um, Smith recommended the introduction of medical examiners in her report of the shipment inquiry. And that was the first really big um, recommendation, but also Robert at Midstaffs, Bill Kirkup, Morgan Bay, all of these scandals that have been investigated have recommended that medical examiners um, would hopefully pick things up much sooner. Um, death certification reform is not new, or at least calls for it are not new. Death certificates were first introduced in 1836, and since then there have been numerous reviews um, and every single one, including the Parliamentary Select Committee in 1893, recommended an overhaul of the system. <laughs> We're just about getting there now, <laughs> uh, so it's taken a while. All of these reports 
uh, again, have all recommended that we should review death certification. And so um, about 10, 15 years ago, the Department of Health funded pilot sites uh, to trial the medical examiner system to see how it would work. And they looked at seven different areas, looking at rural and urban and faith communities. Um, and these seven sites had a go, fully funded from the centre. The biggest of these was Sheffield. They, over 10 years, they reviewed 25,000 deaths. They found possible harm in 10% of cases, so something that could have been done wrong. But family concerns in only 2.3%, so only a quarter of those. And interestingly, they weren't even the same cases. So there wasn't a, huge, a, a massive overlap between where the family had concerns and where the medical examiner had concerns. So they're clearly identifying things that the family had no idea about. 83% changed the wording on the medical certificate of cause of death, the death certificate. Um, about a third required a major change, like a completely different cause of death going for, from, say, an infection to cancer or heart disease, or something completely different. Um, what it resulted in was no rejection of certificates by the registrar. When the family take the certificate to register the death, previously about 2% were rejected by the registrar because there was something wrong with the certificate. Either it hadn't been completed by the right person, so they weren't eligible to sign it, um, or the cause of death that they proposed wasn't one that could be accepted. It either needed to go to the coroner or it didn't give enough detail. Um, what they found with medical examiners completely re removed that and no certificates were rejected. So the medical examiners act as gatekeepers to make sure that certificates given to families um, are able to be registered. There was a concern that relatives would not want another person getting in the way and asking them questions around the time of bereavement. You know, a lot going on, um, very sensitive time, but actually relatives were really grateful to have that opportunity to ask questions. And I've found that repeatedly with the families that I speak to, um, that they like to have the opportunity to ask questions. And sometimes they say, I've got no questions, but I'm really glad that you asked me. Um, and I find that reassuring. So, um, so that, that's good, because it would be awful if we were phoning families who really didn't want to talk to us. Um, and importantly, all of the pilot studies were centrally funded. And I'll tell you why that's important a little later on. And what this slide just shows was, it's anecdotal, but they found that negligence claims for Sheffield at university hospitals, where this med the medical examiner system was piloted, fell. And you'll know, you hear families saying, I didn't, I didn't sue them for the money. It wasn't about the money, it was about making sure this doesn't happen to somebody else. And medical examiners offer an opportunity for families to be listened to, to have somebody to talk to and take their concerns seriously. So whether this will translate into something uh, nationally, we don't yet know, but uh, certainly it seemed to be the case in Sheffield. So when is this all happening? So the Coroners and Justice Act of 2009 put medical examiners in the primary legislation um, to be employed by local authorities, as I mentioned. Um, and medical examiners are still not on a statutory footing. They're still, uh, it's still completely voluntary for trusts to do it. One of the things, one of the several things that held, held up implementation was who was going to pay for it. And what this talks about is the, the newspapers talk about death tax and tombstone tax because the idea for funding was that cremation forms, which families currently pay about £260 for, would be scrapped, so they wouldn't have that payment, and every family would pay around £100 for a medical examiner certificate. So for the 70 to 80% of families who would have cremation, that's quite a big saving, but for those who prefer burial, then that's an additional fee that they wouldn't otherwise have paid. Um, and this wasn't going down terribly well with the papers. And politically, although we, in theory, had cross-party support for medical examiners, nobody really wanted to introduce a death tax. And then Brexit just delayed everything and all these snap elections. And every time we thought we were getting somewhere and getting some momentum, something else would happen. Um, and because we need, we needed changes to the primary legislation and then there's a load of secondary legislation that will underpin statutory implementation. It's all gone on the back burner and it's all in this, this endless queue, um, which I almost certainly don't need to explain to you about. 
But what we did was we got fed up waiting. And there were some early adopter sites, places where there was somebody who had seen the benefit of medical examiners and had set up a service. It was either a pilot site that decided to continue even after the funding had been withdrawn or somewhere else that had seen the benefit of the pilot site and had worked it out. Um, and in fact, it was P Professor Peter Furness in Leicester who found that if you got all of your medical examiners to write cremation forms, you could then use the money from the cremation forms to fund the medical examiner service. And so before the pandemic, that was the model that was rolled out nationally, that medical examiners would use, would be funded by cremation form um, income. And so an official rollout was encouraged from um, April 2019. And it wasn't mandated, it's not statutory, but trusts were invited to set up medical examiner services. And it took probably two years for them all to get a service of some sort, but we now have 100% coverage. Every acute trust has a medical examiner office. Peter Finesse, who I mentioned, was an interim medical examiner, uh, national medical examiner. He did that role for a couple of years, employed by NHS England. But because nothing happened with the legislation, that role just sort of fell by the wayside, which is such a shame because he did an enormous amount of work initially to get things going. Um, but then um, in 2019, an actual substantive national medical examiner was appointed and it's Dr. Alan Fletcher and he was the lead medical examiner for the Sheffield pilot. So the most experienced medical examiner in the country because he'd been working on it um, for 10 years. Um, and this is just to mention Peter, who was the, the previous sort of interim, uh, who just unfortunately, the timing just wasn't quite right. Uh, you know, it would have been great if he'd been able to fly with it at the time. Um, and then, of course, like everything, there's a, there's a governance programme that all uh, lines up. So there's the, the Royal College of Pathologists Medical Examiner Committee, which I chair. So we set the standards and we oversee the training um, of medical examiners. And then there's the, the turquoise box, it's the Department of Health, the Death Certification Reform Strategic Board that I mentioned, and that has General Register Office, Office for National Statistics, Welsh Government, um, Ministry of Justice, Coroner's Society, all the stakeholders you can think of. Um, uh, and then the National Medical Examiner has various committees that all feed in, and he's got his regional uh, medical examiner group. Uh, and so there's various national committees overseeing implementation. So the role of the National Medical Examiner, he sits within the National Patient Safety Team at NHS Improvement at NHS England. And his job is to provide the professional strategic leadership. So I do the education and training. He provides the strategic leadership. So his job is to set the quality standards. And in fact, we do those together. Um, and his role is very collaborative. And what he's trying to do is standardise the way in which the system is rolled out, which is particularly tricky at the moment because it's not statutory. So and we're asking trusts to do it. Um, with the resources that they got. Uh, and so there is some variation, but as we move towards the statutory system, that variation is reducing. He produces a regular bulletin to keep everybody up to date on progress. He's published good practice guidelines, which, which we publish on the Royal College of Pathologists website, uh, and I'll mention a little later. Um, and a series of further guidance around particularly tricky areas like child deaths, learning disabilities, um, anorexia and eating disorders, antimicrobial resistance, and so on. And he issues an annual report, uh, which is launched at the annual medical examiner's conference, which I chair. So the National Medical Examiner, he works three days a week, and he's supported by a very small team uh, there on the left at NHS England. And then there are seven regional medical examiners and medical examiner officers, one for each of seven regions. Um, and then another one for Wales. Um, and so they, they oversee their regions. And there they are, Alan. Um, and this is another one about the death tax fury. Um, and I mentioned that we um, were using cremation form five money. And of course, as soon as we got to the pandemic, cremation form five was scrapped. So all the funding was pulled uh, just at the time when we needed medical examiners most. Um, 
there have been various ministerial statements. I have met at least six, possibly eight ministers. <laughs> in each and lots of photographs would be standing there with a medical examiner booklet, sort of smiling as this, this is going to be the one. Uh, but uh, I'm not even sure who the minister is at the moment. They have changed so much. Um, but the official funding in, 19, in 2018 was initially it will be funded through the information form. And following that, uh, the funding will need to be revisited. And this was to get away from the yeah, and we're going to make you pay for it um, side of things. Um, but what they had to do so that trusts would implement medical examiners was to say it would be cost neutral to trusts because nobody was going to take it on otherwise. It wasn't statutory. They didn't have to do it and nobody's got any spare money. Um, so um, initially it was funding from CREM Form 5. That's the second of two cremation forms, the confirmatory certificate done by an independent senior doctor. And then they said they would top up, the Department of Health would top up for any cases that didn't have cremation form, so for burials, uh, for coroner cases and so on. And there was a small amount of startup cost, it was 750 quid an office, so it wasn't going to go very far, um, but uh, there were some startup costs. And the plan was to develop a digital system to support our work, and that would then feed in and we would get funding uh, quarterly um, uh, in arrears back. Uh, that system, which we were hoping would be ready in 2019, is still not ready. Um, NHS IT systems are not known for their, um, their prompt delivery. We are hoping that it will be available when the scheme goes statutory. Um, and so it was said that the long term funding would be revisited. Um, that, I think, was June, I can't see if that's 21 or 22. Um, ah, this, is, this is from my uh, annual conference this year actually got somebody from the Department of Health to stand up and say, the government will pay for it, which was a huge coup. Uh, I chaired a round table discussion uh, in 2015 um, and had all sorts of stakeholders, charities, bereavement groups, and so on. And the number one thing they wanted was for this to be centrally funded. And the government at the time said, there's absolutely no question of that being possible. And it has. Um, and so it'll be centrally funded in England. Wales still haven't announced how they're going to fund it, but in England, it's been announced it'll be centrally funded. So this is a huge, huge step. So quickly, training about medical examiners. We work with eLearning for Health, which is an on online um, eLearning um, platform, and we've developed 26 core modules. We're quite short, about 20 to 30 minutes, looking at the key areas that we feel every medical examiner has to know, how to write a death certificate, when to refer to the coroner, how to deal with faith deaths, child deaths, organ donation, and so on. Um, these were written in 2011, and Professor Peter Perness was instrumental in getting the first lot um, ready, and they were updated again in 2018, and we will update them again for the statutory system, because that will change slightly um, how the system works. And then people get a certificate, so they've completed them, and then they have to attend a face-to-face -face training day. And initially that was in person, um, and we rotated around the country, so we held them in various places, so easy to get to. And of course, during the pandemic, we went on to Zoom, um, and what we found is people prefer it. So now I'm offering three on Zoom for every one in person, because some people like to uh, come to London for the day. Um, and so we hold those at the college. And we're working on ongoing CPD so that people can continue to develop and I'm planning an update day for next year so medical examiners can come along and do some more training. So this is e-learning for health and the programme was developed with various medical royal colleges, um, the Judicial College, the Coroner Society and so on. And here's just an example of one of the modules, it takes about 20 minutes, about how to do a medical certificate of cause of death. And these are actually really useful for many doctors to just dip in and out of anyway, even if they're not going to be medical examiners. Get to the end, you get a certificate that says that you have done it all, and then you attend an in-person training day. And these are largely scenario based. So we have a load of really terrifying scenarios. I always have to give a health warning at the beginning to the poor new medical examiners saying this is not a typical day at the medical examiner office. I've sort of taken your lifetimes worth of nightmare cases put them all into one. Um, and we have a mixture of medical examiners, medical examiner officers and coroners who are on the faculty, and they each facilitate small group discussion around tables. Um, and then afterwards, the 
um, delegates will get model answers of how we think we would approach each of the scenarios. And they're really useful. I still refer to them very regularly in my office. Um, we have very short presentations um, just for the some just to, to highlight um, the key stakeholders. Coroners, we always have a coroner who will talk about the role of the coroner. Uh, as a pathologist, I'm very, very familiar. Some of my uh, colleagues have not worked with the coroner at all before. We have a medical examiner officer, and I'll talk to you about those a little later on. We have the um, patients associations. We always have a patient representative who comes along and talks to us, which is fantastic. because the, the heart of the whole medical examiner system. And just to hear um, you know, some of the awful stories that we hear um, uh, about, you know, they said it, it wasn't written down so it couldn't have happened. Uh, you know, patients who are not believed, families who are told, you know, that can't have happened, we wouldn't have done that here. Well, what, what the use of use is that? Um, so I'm hoping that we'll, we'll be addressing none of those. We have representatives from faith communities, this is Mohammed Omar, um, from the Muslim Burial Council, um, and we have a representative from the Board of Deputies of British Jews, just talking about the religious requirements for early release of bodies. And I know the faith communities were particularly concerned with the introduction of medical examiners, so it would delay funerals. And if they want to bury um, their loved ones within 24 hours or so. Um, and so medical examiners work very, very hard to make sure that there are no delays at all. Um, uh, I've done one in 14 minutes from the death to releasing the certificate, um, uh, but we're, we're very aware of those pressures. So once um, a medical examiner has done their e-learning and they've completed their face-to-face -face training, they get another certificate and you put those together and they're then essentially done their primary um, training to be medical examiners and they can join the Royal College of Pathologists as um, medical examiner members. There's a similar training day for medical examiner officers um, and uh, so they attend as well and have a, a similar training day. So MEOs, medical examiner officers, are, if you work in healthcare, they're agenda for change band five or six, which will mean nothing to normal people. <laughs> um, but this is just a level of a sort of staff nurse to a more senior nurse. So medical examiner officers can come from nearly any clinical background. They have to have some clinical knowledge, um, but so I've got a research nurse, a radiographer, um, uh, an operating department practitioner. You could have physiotherapists, coroner's officers, paramedics. So people who've got an understanding of either, and typically they haven't got, nobody's really got experience of all aspects, but either things like end of life care, um, or just general clinical knowledge or understanding of how the coroner system works. Um, and it's good to have a mixture of those within a team. And under delegated authority of the medical examiner, they can undertake those three things that MEs do. They can speak to the attending doctor in a really straightforward case. So I had one today, uh, a patient who'd had breast cancer for seven years, who'd been getting weaker and weaker and weaker, and had been told there was nothing more that could be done. She came into hospital and she died and her family were with her. They understood the cause of death. Uh, there were no concerns. And so it's fine for the medical examiner to speak to that family and just, just check that there was nothing uh, that they were worried about. Um, if there's a, a more complex case or where more uh, detailed medical knowledge is required, then the medical examiner would do that, have that conversation, because then we can answer the questions. Um, so you can speak to the attending doctor, speak to the family, um, and liaise with the coroner and the coroner's officer. So they have, they do the same e-learning, they have a separate face-to-face -face training day, and the great thing that they do is provide continuity and oversight, because what I haven't mentioned is medical examiners are part-time, by definition, we all have other jobs, other clinical jobs, uh, whereas medical examiner officers do that all the time. So they're the ones who provide the continuity in the office, um, which is really valuable. I also developed, um, working with the Judicial College earlier this year, five sessions for medical examiners and coroners to get them to work together. Working with coroners, they're probably the key relationship for medical examiners. Um, and so this was trying to get each of them to understand each other's roles and to strengthen that communication and the working relationships between them. And in some places, it works absolutely brilliantly. I spoke to my coroner three times today. I had some particularly challenging cases, and I just wanted to have a chat. I just phoned him on his mobile phone and asked him about it, asked if he wanted them referring in or not. Um, 
And he, because we've developed the service together, he said, if you're happy, and if you've spoken to the doctors, and if you've spoken to the family, and nobody has any concerns, I'm happy for that case not to be referred to me. Because he said, because if you refer it to me, all I'll do is talk to the doctors and talk to the family and ask if they've got any concerns. Um, so it's starting to blur that line very slightly. Clearly, the notification of death regulations are, are absolute, and we know when we have to refer. But there's inevitably always a grey area on the borderline. Um, and so having that sort of working relationship means that we don't unnecessarily refer cases and that we can um, do some of the work. So, for example, it used to be that anyone who had a fall in the run-up to death would be referred to the coroner. Well, that's, that's meaningless if the fall didn't contribute to death. Um, so one of the things we do is investigate whether that contributed to death or not. And sometimes it was completely incidental. Sometimes people have a fall because of an underlying illness, because they had a heart attack or because they've got pneumonia or because they're unsteady on their feet with Parkinson's disease or something. And it's not the fall itself that's caused their death. Um, and working closely with the coroner, it now means that if the medical examiner is happy that the fall didn't contribute, it doesn't go on the death certificate, so it won't be rejected by the registrar and it doesn't have to go anywhere near the coroner. Uh, other coroners work differently. Uh, so there is some variation around the country, but where it works, it works very well. So how do we recruit and appoint medical examiners? So they're employed by acute trusts in England and shared services partnership uh, in Wales. And uh, my medical examiner service, for example, we've got a part-time lead medical examiner. So I get four hours a week to be lead to run the service. And then I have 13 part-time medical examiners, each working four hours each. And I do four hours of medical examining as well. So for me, it's one day a week. For most of my colleagues, it's only half a day a week. And they fit that in around their other commitments. But I have four full-time medical examiner uh, officers who are there all the time. Um, and so they do a lot of the preparatory work. Typically, the office would be in the existing bereavement or mortuary area. Um, the ideal would be to have a shared office. I just love a sort of one-stop shop where you've got the coroner's officer, the registrar, the medical examiner, and you can do it all in one go um, and everything would be registered and we'd have no problem. If we had unlimited money, I think that's what we'd have. Uh, but I think that's something to work towards is to co-locate uh, all the people. They may work across site. So I cover three different hospitals and a hospice. And obviously as we roll out to the community, I cover the, the community desks as well. Um, and smaller hospitals may not have enough deaths. So I have about 2,700 deaths across my two hospitals a year. So that's enough, uh, you know, to have a decent sized medical examiner service. And there's a formula that according to the number of deaths you have, how many medical examiners and medical examiner offices you need. Um, but small hospitals may only have two or three deaths a year. No point them having a service. So they would make an arrangement with an existing service like mine. And similarly for the independent sector, um, they would make an arrangement with a local hospital. Um, at the moment, for us, it's a five day service because out of hours on call is too expensive uh, and currently too difficult to provide. But the aim is ultimately it can be seven days. It won't be 24 hours a day because it's, that's not needed. And there's no point us um, doing a load of work on a Sunday morning if the coroner's not on duty. Obviously, you can contact the coroner any time and the registration service is closed. You can't register the death. Mark will do it at eight, eight o'clock on a Monday morning. In terms of accountability, one of the really important things about medical examiners is that it should be independent of the clinical team that looks after the patient. And that was behind the idea of employing them um, in local authorities. So they'd be completely independent of, say, the hospital where somebody was treated. But that just wasn't practical. So we're professionally independent in the same way that pathologists might do postmortems for the coroner. We may still do them on deaths in the hospital that we work in, um, but we have a different hat on. Um, we're accountable to the trust board in that we're employed by them, but we have a separate independent line of accountability to our regional medical examiner and the national medical examiner. So in terms of learning lessons, um, we really stress the independence. So if any of my medical examiners have had any involvement whatsoever in the care of the patient, they wouldn't review the case. We might talk to them about it as an attending doctor to find more information. And that's often very helpful because they know the information we need to know, um, but they wouldn't review the case as a medical examiner. Um, we then have options for if we identify concerns, what we can do with them. And this is something that's still really evolving. 
So we have the learning from deaths program and we, they, we can send them there for structured judgment reviews where a team of trained um, individuals will review the notes and see if they can identify any concerns. We have mortality and morbidity meetings. So within the surgical directorate, for example, they will every month, they will sit down and review the deaths that have happened in their department to see if there's any lessons to be learned, any trends to be spotted. Um, and then we can request clinical review. So if we feel that we understand what's going on, but it's clear that the family don't, then we can ask the doctors who cared for the patient to sit down and talk to the family and explain it to them. And um, sometimes they haven't had the opportunity to have that while the patient's been alive. Um, and I think that's the one that hopefully is going to reduce the number of complaints that we see because people get the answers they want. It's a very collaborative system. We work really closely with all sorts of people. We work with the bereavement nurses and the um, and, and midwives. We work with the safeguarding team, the tissue viability team, um, lots of all the nurses and matrons on the ward. And we give a lot of feedback. We collect data, which gets submitted. A lot of it goes in centrally, but also we use it locally because one of the really important things we need to do is to identify trends. So it's to stop somebody like Schickman who comes along and, you know, I think there've been lots of things that have been introduced to try and make sure that doctors are up to scratch and to stop the next Schickman. But I think medical examiners is the one that would have done it um, because you have that overview um, of deaths and, and spot these trends. And I'm aware of a hospital where two patients died from a particular infection and it was traced back to a ward that they both happened to be on for not very long. So it wasn't the ward they died on. Um, but they'd been on a ward and it turned out there was an outbreak on that ward. And so we managed to nip it in the bud after two cases, whereas it could have gone on almost indefinitely if that hadn't been picked up. Um, and then it gives a regional overview and a national overview as we submit that data through the main system. So our latest numbers, um, 1,721 medical examiners have now been trained. So that's enough to staff all of the medical examiner offices in the country. Over 500 medical examiner officers have been trained. Um, again, that's probably enough. So now our training is moving. Uh, we're holding it less frequently, and it's now just for sort of natural turnover rather than um, training a, a huge cohort for, for a new specialty. We had 400 coroners and medical examiners attending the joint training earlier this year. All 129 acute trusts have medical examiner services and over 90% of deaths in those trusts are being reviewed by a medical examiner. And most are starting to cover some community deaths. So we started in hospitals, so that was just much easier to do. And then we're starting to cover deaths in the community. There are quite a lot of challenges um, in doing that. Um, Frankly, just the logistics of getting hold of records. Some, uh, some of us have access to the same the medical record uh, in the community, some don't. Different GP practices and different hospitals use different systems, they don't all talk to each other. Um, one of my hospitals only uses paper notes, uh, which means you have to physically go and get them. Um, and um, so just IT, as always, is, is one of the challenges. And the other is the massive pressure that GPs are under at the moment. Um, huge workload, lots of people retiring, leaving, cutting back on hours because of that. Um, and this is just another thing that we're asking GPs to take on and to work with us on. Thankfully, um, I think we're just doing it by demonstrating that it works. So find a few earlier doctors who will champion it. And actually the feedback we're getting from our GPs is they really value the advice that we can give. They don't um, have very many deaths a year. They may have three or four deaths a year in their practice. Um, and so they may not know when to refer to the coroner or what to write on the death certificate. And so medical examiners can discuss those with the doctor um, and help support them and make those decisions. Um, and hopefully it saves some time actually in the long run. Um, and so I think we're just up to 11%. So I've just gone into double figures in terms of the number of community deaths that have been covered. So in terms of legislation, the Coronavirus Act um, ended in, in March this year and that really sped up a lot of things. Um, the Health and Care Act um, on April the 28th got royal assent, and that was that changed the primary legislation that said medical examiners had to be under local authorities and put them into the NHS. So now we can build on that. And so the secondary legislation required is going to be to change medical certificates of the cause of death 
because medical examiners will have to sign them off, whether digitally or virtually, really, um, to say that they approve the cause of death and re have reviewed the case. And that doesn't happen at the moment. Um, so that will have to be changed. The role of the registrar will change. At the moment, registrars can reject deaths or send them to the coroner if they're not happy with the cause of death. But all of that sorting out of the cause of death will be done at the medical examiner stage before it reaches the registrar. So that will mean um, some subtle changes in the role of the registrar. The Form 100A, which a coroner issues to say that they don't need to investigate the death and the doctors can go ahead and issue the certificate, will change. We don't know exactly how, but medical examiners will be able to essentially authorise some of those cases which would previously have had to go to a coroner. And cremation forms will go completely because they won't be required because medical examiners will do that scrutiny. However, there are a few areas that were concerned that there'll be just gaps that aren't being picked up. So for example, it's the cremation forms that ask whether somebody has a pacemaker because it may explode in the crematorium. If you get rid of creme forms, nobody else is being asked that. So it's going to be added to the medical certificate of cause of death. But they're also going to add ethnicity because one of the things that came out of the pandemic was that we didn't know the ethnicity of people who died. And of course we know now that there was the differential illness and death rates uh, according to people's ethnicity, but it wasn't being recorded. Um, so that is likely to be added as well. Um, so the Coronavirus Act of 2020 got rid of Crown Form 5, so that got rid of our funding. So the, um, we had to be then centrally funded, and it was initially meant to be just the duration of the pandemic, but as I've mentioned, it's now going to be permanent. It used to be that somebody had to be seen by a doctor within 14 days for the certificate to be uh, accepted by the registrar. That was extended to 28 days. Um, during the pandemic, any doctor who knew the cause of death could complete the certificate rather than it being a doctor who had treated the deceased. And this was to, because doctors were so busy, they were on the wards, they may have been off with COVID themselves, they may have been isolating. Um, and so it was just not practical to expect them to attend and write. And of course, the death certificate is a paper, it's a piece of paper, so they have to physically come somewhere and fill it in. Um, for the first time, electronic transmission of the death certificate was permitted. It used to be that the piece of paper was put in a brown envelope, the family had to come to the hospital and be given it, and then they had to physically take it to the registrar, which just feels completely outdated. And so electronic transmission was introduced, and for the first time, deaths could be registered over the phone, rather than the family having to attend the registrar in person. When the Coronavirus Act came to an end two years after it was introduced, three of the easements were continued by adding them to other legislation that was going through. So Crem Form 5 was got rid of permanently. So we don't have that. So that's why our funding went, because why it had to be funded centrally. Um, the 28 day rule remained. So that again is really helpful. Obviously in hospitals, people will have seen a doctor within 14 days, hopefully within two days, but um, in the community, uh, it's not terribly long. The any doctor rule went because there was no intention that it could be just any doctor could write a certificate. So it has to be a doctor who attended the deceased during their last illness. But the electronic transmission of the certificate has remained, which is fantastic. But the registration of death over the phone has gone. So families still have to attend the registrar to register a death because they have to physically sign a register. That may change at some point in the future, but at the moment, that's where we are. So work in progress is a digital case management system um, that will mean that when we have all of our deaths come in, we'll be able to put in the patient details and then the attending doctor will be able to um, log in from wherever they are and add their bits about this is what happened to the patient and this is what I think is the cause of death. And the medical examiner can do their review of the notes and then everything's all in one place. At the moment, every medical examiner um, office has had to find its own way of recording information. I've made my own form that has all of these different data sets to fill in. Some people use hospital notes because then it's recorded on the electronic system, but this will be a national system that we'll all use. The aim is that the digital, the medical certificate of cause of death will go digital, so it will no longer be a piece of paper. It will be something that's done online, doctors will fill it in, the medical examiner will sign it, and then that will get sent straight to the registrar. So there'll be no more bits of paper. We are carefully monitoring the impact on coroners. Um, I think what we've seen is that fewer cases are being referred to the coroner, 
but the cases that are being referred are more complex, not surprisingly. So we're getting rid of the easy ones and the ones that didn't really need to go, but the ones that we are sending are the ones where there are more concerns. So the number of in the proportion of inquests is going up because the cases are more complex. Um, we're still working on community deaths. Um, I have done two <laughs> in my, in my uh, service. Uh, so we're rolling them out, but as I say, it's up to about 11% nationally. Continuing professional development. I am working on an update day, so medical examiners can come along and it'll be very scenario based. The secondary legislation to make all those other changes have to align um, so that this can move to a statutory footing. We still haven't got an implementation date. The announcement at the um, conference in uh, May this year was from April 2023. And of course, most people think that means it will start in April 2023, but apparently from means at any point after 2023. Um, so we're still waiting for a date. I don't think it'll be next April because I think you need a lead time that's longer than the time we've got left. Um, if we're going to put all these other things into place. So I suspect it, it probably will be next year sometime, but I doubt if it'll be April 1st. Um, the idea is that everything that's required for the statutory scheme will be in place before it becomes statutory. So it'll be a seamless transfer. And so we'll be working up to 100% of community deaths and we'll have the digital system and we'll have the digital MCCD. And hopefully on the day we go statutory, we won't notice because we'll have got there already. So we're working in that direction. And I think a really important thing that we're starting to think about is quality assurance of the system. How do we know medical examiners are doing what they're meant to be doing and what we say they're doing? Um, so there's going to have to be some way of assuring at us. Um, so concerns the extra work and capacity, particularly for primary care, GPs, really, really busy. We're also, of course, stealing experts from all the other different specialties uh, to come and do medical examining. Uh, they seem to really enjoy it. Uh, people, a lot of people are moving towards portfolio careers and the variety uh, seems to really appeal to a lot of people. So I'm hoping it will keep people working longer rather than putting them off. It may increase referral to the coroner and the number of inquests. Coroners were worried initially we would nick all the coroner's officers to come over medical examiner officers. And I think some have moved, but similarly, some of our MEOs have moved on to be coroner's officers because they've become interested in that. So I don't think that's a problem. Initially, there was a concern that phase one was not in primary care. It's all in hospitals. And, you know, Shipman was in primary care. So why are we doing it there? It's just because it was the easy, pragmatic way to actually get it started. Now, the concern is it phase two is in primary care because primary care are overrun and they haven't got capacity to do it. And they quite like us to delay it for a couple of years, um, which of course is a challenge. It does require secondary legislation and how long is a piece of string as to whether that, when that's going to get through. Independence, I think it's always going to be a concern. You could understand that families will say, well, you say you're independent, but you work in that hospital and they pay your wages. And, you know, how independent is that? But there's no real practical way of getting doctors to work at hospitals that are you know, an hour and a half away from the one that they're based at. Um, and the big concern is that no action is taken. So we need that feedback loop. It's all very well us feeding in our concerns into the governance structure, but if it doesn't happen and nothing, you know, if we're just shouting into a black hole, then that's pointless. So we need to be making sure that change is happening as a result of the intelligence that we're feeding in. There's loads of information about medical examiners on the Royal College of Pathologists website. Um, and I mentioned the good practice series to give guidance um, on particular areas. The Department of Health has an overview of the reforms and all of the consultations and things that have gone on. And the National Medical Examiner has his bulletins and regular updates. We have an annual conference this year. It's on or next year. It's Wednesday, May the 17th, um, which is an opportunity particularly in the morning, to get all the policy people in to come and talk about policy and where this is going and what the timing is. And it's been when we've had the big ministerial announcements uh, about next steps. So headlines have been a long time coming. I've been working on it for probably about 15 years and others have been working on it for longer than that. It's currently non-statutory, but it's working remarkably well considering. Um, we've got a national leadership team. It's in all acute trusts now. We're rolling out the community. We're waiting for our secondary legislation. It'll be from April next year, so sometime after April. And the central funding is hugely important. And I'm just going to finish with some feedback. And I won't read these all out to you. You can um, read them. 
But this is the sort of thing that families say to us when we say, oh, you know, I hope this hasn't been too much of, of an inconvenience, you know, talking to us. I'm, you know, sorry for your, your loss. Um, and people say, it was brilliant to speak to somebody who was kind and listened and was understanding. Um, they couldn't make promises, but said they'd look into things. And often people say, I don't need any feedback. I just want to know that you're going to do something about it. So we will go and talk to the ward matron um, and give feedback so that they're aware. Um, and families that feel that they've been listened to. And here's another one. Um, you know, people say things like, you know, if the medical examiner hadn't phoned, I don't know who else I'd have spoken to. You know, I didn't want to go through PALS, the patient um, advised liaison service. I don't want to make a complaint, but I wouldn't have known who to tell. And I know from talking to families, you know, that some of them have got questions from deaths 20, 30 years ago. You know, my grandmother died. I have no idea what of, and we don't know what happened. And hopefully they're going to reduce all of those. Um, so feedback has been really positive. Happy to answer any questions. They're my email addresses if you ever want to get in touch with me. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. I've talked for too long as usual. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, firstly, any, we are a little bit of time now. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Hello. Shall I stand? I'm going to stand. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much for that interesting talk. Um, one of the first things, if not the first thing you mentioned, was how Shipman. But you only talked about identifying trends on one slide. I'm interested to know how you identify trends. And particularly, you talked about the importance of ethnicity in the difference between how COVID affected certain groups. Surely, it's there's identifying trends in a local setting to identify culpability, but also identifying trends on a much bigger scale to see how outcomes are different for different groups of people. Yeah. And I wonder whether that's part of your system and yeah. how you do it. Yeah, it is. Um, I'll answer the second one first, sure. <laughs> that's okay, about trends. So, um, because you've got lots of different medical examiners, it would be quite easy for trends to be missed because they're all working half a day a week. So the lead medical examiner has an overview and really importantly, the medical examiner officer has an overview. We have a spreadsheet on which we record all of our deaths, all of our wards. We started quite early on recording all of the care homes and residential homes that patients came into so that we can keep an eye on those. And so every month we will pull off a report that says this number came from this care home. And in fact, we've got one care home that we and the coroner are worried about. And so we pay particular care um, uh, for those. So I think long term, a lot of the information will be fed in for regional and national review because we'll go, we'll have a national system, an online system. At the moment, it tends to be just local. Um, and we're very much looking at trends in um, in medical conditions. So for example, we're looking for antimicrobial resistance if there are any. Uh, infections that have been resistant to particular antibiotics, we're looking at those. So that's not necessarily something that's gone wrong or a, con a complaint, but it is a health trend in the same way that it became clear very early on that different ethnic groups had different responses to COVID. So that's very much part of, of, of our job. Can you remind me of your first question now, please? <laughs> the first point, because I can't remember. It, it was uh, the same issue, but about identifying uh, trends on a local level and nice. trends on a bigger yeah. level. So at the moment, we're relatively good at it locally. Um, we're less good at it regionally and nationally, but I hope as we move towards the statutory system and the statutory recording um, and submission of data, that it will become easier for that to be reviewed regionally and nationally. Thank you. I don't see any questions on screen. The home audience need to be getting on their typewriters. Keyboard, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions at the room? Yes. You mentioned donations. Could you identify yourself? Oh, in the I'm, of the audience of I'm Adam Scott, and apart from being a master of the bench here, I'm also a clergyman and work closely with our local university hospital on death, dying, and donation. Uh, and at the weekend, was 
faced with a death which is a, as yet unexplained young man. One of the questions in my mind is, are you in there swiftly enough to get onto the donation point? Because you did mention donation. And the other is the whole question of post-mortems, which in some cases raises a whole lot of religious issues. Uh, uh, and coroner's officers can be very good at counseling families on why a post-mortem might be necessary and, and the implications of it. So for donations, similarly with faith deaths, if it happened during the working day, so sort of 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., then we could be on it immediately. I have a medical examiner officer and a medical examiner who are on duty all day. So as soon as we become aware of her death, and it can be before the person's actually died um, or being declared dead, um, we can start working with the specialist nurses um, to ensure that donation can happen. So out of hours at the moment, because we have no out of hour service, we're reverting to the previous system, which is get on with it without the medical examiner. When we get to the statutory system, we're going to have to put something in place to make sure that we can um, provide the same level of responsiveness out of hours as we do in hours, but we're not there yet. I think there's going to have to be some more funding for the centre to enable us to do that. This is not enough people. Um, the second point was post-mortems. Post-mortems. So medical examiner officers really fulfil a very similar role to coroner's officers in terms of counselling families. We, as the whole team, are very acutely aware of um, religious, cultural, and just personal preferences around postmortems. And so we will often speak to families about, so that we can help the coroner make informed decisions about how families feel about postmortems. And sometimes they'll say, we really want to know the detail. Yes, we know he had lung cancer, but you know, had it gone to his brain, had it gone to his liver, you know, we want to know. Um, and others say, they've been through enough, they wouldn't have wanted it, we don't want a post-mortem, and we have to explain why it may be necessary. Um, but then we can convey that information to the coroner's team so that they're aware of the family's views. Um, and we can provide, we, you know, all we can do is provide as much information as possible for the coroner to make that decision. But we are acutely aware of the distress that post-mortems can cause to families and the possibility of things like CT post-mortems. Um, we don't have a huge um, number of those where we are, uh, but I know there are some areas that can do. I think that's the future. Um, I think CT postmortems and hugely reducing the number of conventional invasive postmortems, I think is, is the way to go. But again, it needs more money. Okay, any more questions? Uh -huh. Hang on. Sarah, there's a question from yeah. online. You mentioned three aims. What did the person die from? Does this need to go to the coroner? And are there any political governments concerned? Have there been any significant issues you have personally experienced which have posed you question to question the death? Or will all these matters be off to the coroner's office when questioned? I spent a long time trying to work out whether the cases need to go to the coroner or not. Um, and that's partly why I speak to my coroner as frequently as I do, because of these grey areas that I mentioned. So today I had a patient who died with lung disease that's possibly related to the treatment that he had had for prostate cancer. Um, and he also developed an infection. And it's again possible that the treatment for cancer had um, affected his immune system, so he was more susceptible to infection. So in the very strictest sense of the interpretation of the notification of death regulations, you could argue that a medical treatment had caused immunosuppression and had caused some fibrosis in the lungs and that this had contributed to death and that this needed to go to the coroner. Knowing my coroner, <laughs> uh, I thought he probably wouldn't feel the need to know about this. Um, so what I did was talk to the attending doctor and found out that the um, chemotherapy that had been given was appropriate. It was the right chemotherapy for the, for the tumour. It was given at the right dose, at the right intervals, and that there'd been appropriate monitoring all the way along, looking at blood tests and things and so on, and had established that that was the case. So it was appropriate treatment, and that these were recognised side effects of a necessary and appropriate treatment. We then spoke to the family, saying, what are your feelings about the care 
of your loved one. Um, and they'd understood that he could have died five years ago if he hadn't had the treatment. And they were grateful for the extra time that they had had. They had understood, and so the deceased had also understood that there were side effects of the treatment. He'd known there was an increased risk of infection, clearly having lived through the pandemic with cancer, he understood that. Um, and it was a risk that he was prepared to accept. And so I was able to then conclude that actually the coroner wouldn't want to know about this. I did phone him just to check <laughs> and just gave him the scenario. And he said, no, you're right. Um, I'm happy that if, if treatment was appropriate and you as a doctor are happy that it was, and if the family have no concerns, then there's no point sending it to us because all I would do would be ask the same questions. I'm not sure if that answers that, answer that question. <laughs> I think so. Yes, thank you. Another one. Would there ever be an option to do a post-mortem after the body's been buried for a few weeks? I'm not sure that comes out. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, yes, so you can exhume bodies and do post-mortems. Um, it doesn't happen very often. That is why there's always been an extra layer um, of uh, bureaucracy for people who've been cremated, because obviously it's not possible for someone being cremated. So you have cremation forms, so you had an independent doctor checking that there were no concerns. Whereas for burials, if you needed to, you could exhume the body. I've never done it. I've never been asked to do it. It doesn't happen very often. You need a special order from the coroner to be able to do it, but it's possible. The sorts of things that you hear about, perhaps historically, are things like heavy metal poisoning um, or, or poisonings, because you can then, even if there's been decomposition, you can often find um, elements in, in the hair or in the bones and so on. Um, but I've probably got most of the, my information from television dramas rather than... <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, I think I'll, I'll ask if I may take the privilege of this sitting in the chair, just one final question. Uh, a number of people in the audience uh, may be attend inquests as advocates, uh, and, I just, and indeed take part in other forms of legal challenge. And so it's a two-part question. One is, do you anticipate or have you had any instances of legal challenge of medical examiner's decisions not to refer to a coroner? Point one. Point two, is there experience of medical examiners being called at inquests to give evidence and what, and what sort of areas are you having to expect to be questioned about? Again, answer the first, the second one first, which is, in the early days, medical examiners were being called to inquest, but then it was explained that they were an independent reviewer, so they weren't an expert witness because they haven't cared for the patient. And the general advice to coroners is not to call medical examiners. They may have our reports and they may use those, but medical examiners should not expect to be called because we're not, we weren't involved in the care of the deceased, so we'll give our opinion. What's the first one? Legal, the legal challenge of decisions not to refer to the court. So I haven't come across any, partly because we're really careful to talk to as many people as possible before it gets to that stage. So even if I think a cause of death is completely straightforward, somebody's come in, they've got pneumonia and they've died. Um, all the evidence is that this was a pneumonia that didn't respond to antibiotics. It was treated correctly, but the person was just too frail and they died. But if the family feel that the person died because of a concern, either you know, in the care home or the GP didn't get antibiotics soon enough, or there was something on the ward, I would refer that to the coroner at that stage. Um, so family concerns about something, even if I don't share those concerns, unless they're completely ridiculous, um, then I would refer to the coroner and provide as much information as possible for the coroner to then take the next steps. We always say, we do review and scrutiny, and it's up to the coroner to do the investigation. But we try to provide the coroner with as much information as we can from our review for them to be able to decide on next steps. Susie, thank you very much. I think I will call the poll today. But I'll just make, before we ask the audience to thank you in the usual way, uh, to make a point that there's a, 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 a learning point here for those of us who may have written reports in the past the end of public inquiries and made recommendations. It's all very well for us, you said there, to make a grand recommendation that there should be medical examiners. I wasn't the first to do so, and I wasn't the last, but I think you've demonstrated how much detail is just from that simple recommendation is required and how easy it might be to criticise the length of time it takes to put something in place until you hear the story that you've told. But finally, I'd just like to say 
on behalf of patients to thank you for what you've done, because there is, in fact, a, a huge benefit for bereaved families to know that there is someone independently looking at causes of death. And actually also on behalf of the poor doctors who end up having to write uh, 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 death certificates, often still circumstances where they're not, frankly, hugely qualified to do it. And there is now a source of help. So for both those reasons, I think this is wonderful. But thank you very much for enlightening us on a very important subject. Thank you very much.